Hi, greetings. It's me, Dr. Paul Gerhardt, and this is the sixth video in my Essentials of Negotiation series. This particular video focuses on some of the psychology and some critical negotiation sub-processes, including perception, cognition, and emotions. If you've taken other classes from me or watched other videos, you know that uh, being an effective leader really delves deeply into the psychology of uh, being a human. So re this is really all about human relationships and being able to manage negotiations in an effective way and understanding what's taking place and what you can do to create effective negotiations. Uh, so let's really talk about the psychology of perception, how it's related to the process of negotiation with attention to forms of perception distortion. We uh, will look into how negotiators use information to make decisions about tactics and strategy, the process of cognition, and we'll first focus on what's called framing, uh, the strategic use of information to define and articulate a negotiation issue or situation. And then secondly, we'll discuss cognitive biases in information processing. We experience and express emotion when we interact with others and negotiation is certainly no exception. Uh, finally, at the end of the video, we'll discuss the role of moods and emotions in negotiation, both as causes of behavior and as consequences of negotiated outcomes. So let's dive right into perception. Perception is the process by which individuals connect to their environment by ascribing meaning to messages and events. Perception is really sense-making. It's processes where people interpret their environment so that they can respond appropriately. You know, something happens, a stimulus. We focus our attention on it. We recognize it. Then we translate it in our brains, which then leads to our behaviors or actions. Perceptions really are uh, typically complex. So as perceivers, uh, we become very selective. And I think that's really key is... Uh, we perceive things and then we, we put our focus on things, per which leads us to perceptual distortion. Uh, stereotyping is a term that we use a lot when we're talking about relationships. And of course, negotiation really is about how we manage our relationships with other people. And stereotyping occurs when a person assigns or attributes uh, another uh, something on someone else on the basis of a person's social or demographic category. Maybe it's about the person's gender or the person's uh, ethnicity or the color of the person's skin or sexual orientation, whatever it is, uh, it's very common for people to place a stereotype on someone else. And once a stereotype is formed, uh, it's really it, it could be hard for a person to break out of that um, um, judgment based on that stereotype. Uh, one of my favorite uh, things to remember is something called the halo effects. And these occur when people generalize about a variety of attributes based on the knowledge of one um, attribute of an individual. Maybe we see something that we like about another person. Well, that translates into other things. Uh, and that could be either positive or negative, actually. So, and we have to be aware of how the halo affects uh, affects the way people are interacting with us or how uh, we interact with other people. And I like to think about putting your best foot forward. You know, when you first meet somebody, you could leave a good first impression by the way that you dress, about the way that you treat the other person right off the bat, and that can create a positive playing field. Selective perception is also very um common and that occurs when perceivers um, single out supporting information and filter out information that does not really confirm their beliefs and and people are always doing in the back of their mind. and when you're interacting with other people it's interesting how people will focus on something but ignore something else based on you know the perception and so that in itself perpetuates stereotypes and the halo effects uh, projection is another very common thing that happens as we're interacting with other people and it occurs when people assign uh, 
to others characteristics or feelings that they possess themselves uh, usually arises out of a need to protect one's own self-concept. And that leads us to framing. A frame is a subjective mechanism allowing people to evaluate situations, leading them to pursue or avoid subsequent actions. Two or more people involved in the same situation or in a complex problem often see, see it or define it in different ways. And these frames can change depending on perspective or they can change over time. How parties frame an issue is a reflection of what they see as critical to the objectives, their outcomes, expectations, and preferences, what information they need to argue their case, procedures they use to uh, present their case, and then the manner in which they evaluate outcomes. Frames are inevitable. They occur without any real intention by the negotiator. So let's talk about the different types of frames. There's substantive, uh, which uh, really is about the conflict, what it's about, the outcome, uh, a party's predisposition to achieving a specific role, to, role or outcome from the negotiation, aspiration, uh, disposition to uh, satisfy a broader set of interests or needs in negotiation, process, how the party will go about resolving their dispute, identity, how the party, who they are, characterization, how the parties define the other parties, and then loss or gain, how the parties define the risk or reward associated with particular outcomes. So let's get to the nitty gritty on how frames work in negotiation. Negotiators can use more than one frame. Mismatches in frames between parties are sources of conflict. Parties negotiate differently depending on the frame and specific frames may be likely to be used with certain types of issues. Particular types of frames may lead to particular types of agreements and parties are likely to assume a particular frame because of various factors. Differences in values, personality, power, background, social context. All these may lead to parties to adopt a different frame. Uh, um, another approach to frames are interests, rights, and power. An influential approach to framing disputes suggests that parties in conflict use one of three frames. Interests, where people are often concerned about what they need, desire, or interest. Rights, people may also be concerned about who is right, that is, who has legitimacy, who is correct, what is fair, and then power. Uh, power is sometimes based on who is physically stronger, uh, but more often it's really about imposing uh, their types of costs, economic pressures, expertise, legitimate authority, and then so on. I'm the vice president. You're just a union employee. You know, those types of things often affect, you know, how the negotiations go. The way a party frames the problem will likely influence how the other party responds. The frame of an issue changes as the negotiator evolves. That's the thing about uh, psychology is how we see the world around us affects our attitudes, which affects what we do. So, um, and these are constantly changing as we're getting new information or we start to see things differently. The frame of an issue changes as the negotiator is, is evolving. Uh, disputes tend to transform through naming, blaming, and then claiming. So naming occurs when parties in a dispute label uh, or identify a problem and characterize what that's about. Blaming occurs next as the party tries to determine who or what caused the problem. And then finally, claiming. Uh, that occurs when individuals uh, who have the problem decides to confront, uh, file charges, or take some other action against the individual or organization that caused the problem. Frames are shaped by the bargaining mix. So arguing stock issues, arguing best possible case. They may define major shifts and transition. Finally, multiple agenda items shape frames. Critical 
to issue development is the process of reframing changes to trust, tone, and then focus of a conversation. We have something called cognitive biases. Uh, they're irrational, irrational escalation of commitment. An escalation of commitment is making decisions that stick with a failing course of action. Even when the commitment constitutes irrational behavior, due in part to biases and perception and judgment, a negotiator seeks supportive evidence and ignore uh, disconfirming evidence. Uh, initial commitments become set in stone, and then a desire for a consistency prevents changing them, made worse by a desire to face, save face. So you have to fight a bias. You know, use an advisor to serve as a reality check. There may be less desire to escalate if regret is felt following a, a previous escalation situation. So we really have to be aware of sometimes just because we feel strongly about something, we may be ignoring key information that we that really needs to be revisited. So having someone that's like a third party to help us know what we don't know and check our perception really is key. Cognitive biases and mythical fixed pie beliefs are really important to consider too. Neg negotiators may also assume all negotiations involve a fixed pie. We all talk about there's only so much pie to go around. And they may approach integrative negotiation opportunities as a zero-sum situation or win-lose exchanges. Negotiators focusing on personal gain are most likely to come under the influence of a fixed pie belief, where those focusing on values are less likely to see a fixed pie. Fight biases. Uh, we talked earlier about you know how to to do that you know focus on underlying interests and and you may see your fixed pie perception as being misguided and hold negotiators accountable for the way uh, that they negotiate or uh, that they negotiate you know call people on I don't see uh, that there's only so much pie to go around I see that there are other things that we should consider. So that's why um, really recognizing cognitive biases, you know, uh, with framing and risk. So uh, prospect theory holds that people are more risk averse when a problem is framed as a possible gain and risk seeking when framed as a loss. When risk adverse negotiators are, are likely to accept any offer simply because they are afraid of losing. In contrast, when risk-seeking negotiators may wait for a better offer and further concession. This process is important as, as the same offer can be illicitly marked uh, different courses of action depending on how it is framed in gain-loss terms. Fight bias. Have awareness. Uh, get enough e sufficient information. Do a thorough analysis. Do the reality check. Can um, be diff this could be difficult to fight as frames may be tied to deep values and anchors that are hard to detect. You know, you've, we've probably all been in conversations with people who felt so strongly about something they wouldn't listen or wouldn't pay attention to things that we brought to our conversations so and we also have to be aware of uh, the cognitive bias of anchoring and adjustment these biases are related to the effect of the standard or anchor against which subsequent adjustments are made during negotiation anchors can be uh, a trap as a choice of an anchor may be based on faulty or incomplete information and therefore it's misleading once an anchor is defined, parties tend to treat it as a benchmark by which to adjust other judgments. Goals, whether realistic or not, can serve as anchors and may be public or private as well as conscious and unconscious. Fight the bias through preparation, uh, the use of devil's advocate or a reality check, and both can help prevent errors of anchoring and a judgment. So 
cognitive cognitive biases um, really are could be shaped by the availability of information. Uh, negotiators must also be concerned with the potential bias caused by the availability of information or how easy information is to achieve. This also affects negotiation through the use of established search patterns and over evaluation of information resulting from those searches. So you can fight your bias by checking the accuracy of things. Don't just um, accept that what's being brought to the table is fully factual. Cognitive biases, the winner's curse. This refers to the tendency to settle quickly on an item and then subsequently feel discomfort about the negotiation uh, when it comes too easily. The negotiator may suspect the other party has uh, an unseen advantage and think they could have done better uh, or that the deal is bad. Fight the bias. The best remedy for a winner's curse is to prevent it from happening in the first place. And then prepare adequately uh, to prevent making an offer that is unexpectedly accepted. So having overconfidence also can have a cognitive biases. Overconfidence has a double-edged effect. It can solidify a negotiator's support of incorrect or inappropriate actions, and it can lead negotiators to discount the worth or validity of the judgments of others. You can fight this overconfidence bias by really studying the results, uh, and negotiators should always suppress confidence or optimism. The con cognitive bias of the law of small numbers is something that we have to be aware of, too. In negotiation, this applies to the way negotiators learn and extrapolate from their experience. If experience is limited, the tendency is to project that experience onto future negotiations. And this may lead to a self-fulfilling prophecy. People who expect to be treated in a distributive manner will be more likely to perceive the other party's behaviors as distributive and treat the other party in a more distributive manner uh, who then may reciprocate. You could fight this bias by remembering if you have less experience, you may use that experience erroneously in the future. Uh, styles and strategies that worked in the past may not work in the future, especially if the negotiations differ, in which, of course, they will. No negotiation is ever the same. Cognitive biases of a self-serving bias. Uh, people often explain uh, another's behavior by making attributions, either to the person, the internal factor, or the situation, the external factor. In explaining others' behavior, we often overestimate the role of ex internal factors and underestimate the role of external factors. People attribute their own behavior to situational factors, but others uh, to personal ones. This bias may also involve distortions in the evaluation of information. The false consensus effect means overestimating support and consensus for your own position, opinions, or behaviors. You can fight this bias and, and know that negotiators may make faulty judgments regarding tactics or outcome probabilities. And, and just be aware of the bias. Use a reality check of... The endowment effect is another cognitive bias we should be aware of. The endowment effect is the tendency to overvalue something you own or believe you possess. In, in negotiation, this can lead to inflated estimations of value that interfere with reaching a good deal. And negotiators are fine with using a status quo as an anchor, making concessions difficult. You can fight this bias, and it's very uh, difficult to fight or defend against. And use the devil's advocate uh, to make sure you are not initiating this effect. Ignoring others' cognitions. Failure to consider the other party's cognitions allows negotiators to simply 
simplify their thinking about otherwise complex processes. This may lead to a distributive strategy and failure to recognize the, the contingent nature of both sides of uh, behavior and responses. And in contrast, when negotiators are able to consider things from the other party's viewpoint, or pers you're, you're doing perspective taking, the risk of impasse is reduced when the chances for integrative outcomes via log rolling is enhanced. You could fight this bias by training and awareness uh, moderately reduce effects. This can also be avoided if you explicitly focus on forming an accurate understanding of the other party's interests, goals, and perspectives. This really checking for understanding along the way is so important. Did you mean this or did you mean this? Can you give an example of this? Those kinds of things can really help the other person know that you're considering their perspective and listening. And listening is one of the most powerful tools in the negotiation process, right? So uh, reactive devaluation is another cognitive bias to consider. And this is a process of devaluing the other party's concessions simply because the other party made them. This leads negotiators to minimize the magnitude of a concession made by a, dis, uh, a disliked other, uh, reduce their willingness to respond with a concession of equal size, seek even more from the other party once a concession has been made. So you could fight this bias. Uh, you or a colleague should maintain an objective view of the process, clarify each uh, side, preference on options and concessions before any are made, and use a third party to uh, mediate or filter concession-making processes. Let's talk about managing misperceptions and cognitive biases. Misperceptions and cognitive biases typically arise out of a conscious awareness as negotiators gather and process information. The first level of, of managing such distortions is to be aware that they can occur. Awareness may not be enough. Simply knowing about them does not really counteract their effects. So you have to be aware of the existence of these biases, understand their negative effects, and then be prepared to discuss them when appropriate with your own team and with counterparts. Moods, emotion, and negotiation. We get to choose our moods, right? The role of mood and emotion in negotiation has often been an increasing body of theory and research during these last two decades. The distinction between mood and emotion is based on three characteristics, specificity, intensity, and then duration. A mood st state is uh, more diffuse, less intense, and more enduring than emotion states, which tend to be more intense and targeted. Emotions play important roles in the various stages of negotiation. So let's talk about that a little bit more. Here's what the research findings and studies on mood, emotions, and negotiations say. Negotiations create both positive and negative emotions. Positive emotions generally have positive consequences. Aspects of the process can lead to positive emotions. Negative emotions generally have negative consequences, and they may lead to defining a situation as competitive, and they may undermine the ability to analyze the situation accurately. And we all have the power to affect each other, and that means we also affect uh, their perception of what's going on. And again, our actions affect outcomes, right? Negotiate, uh, negative emotions may lead parties to escalate conflict. Negative emotions may lead to retaliation and discourse and um, integrative outcomes. Not all negative emotions have the same effect. Negotiators make smaller demands of worried or disappointed opponents, but fewer concessions to uh, guilty or regretful opponents. The effects of positive and negative emotions in negotiation are as such. Positive feelings may have negative consequences. Negotiators in a positive mood may be susceptible to deceptive tactics. 
and achieve less optimal outcomes. Uh, if there is no agreement, defeat may be harsh and counterproductive. Negative feelings may create positive outcomes. Generally, well-expressed anger can lead to positive outcomes. Negative emotion has informational uh, value as a danger signal. Anger may signal toughness, but not always. It can, it can work in your favor if the anger is seen as appropriate, but it can also backfire. Uh, and it's less likely to work with a deceiver or one who has little at stake to begin with. Negative emotion can benefit powerfully uh, for negotiators, but it provides less focus and poor out low power negotiators. Finally, it's important to remember that emotions can be used strategically as negotiation gambits. Emotions may be used strategically as influence tactics in negotiation. Negotiators exhibiting positive emotionality were more likely to induce compliance with ultimatum offers. A negotiator uh, displaying sadness elicits concern from the other party and can extract concessions and claim value. And this works only when uh, displayed by those with low power. Uh, emotional manipulation does not work for high power negotiators. Negotiators may also engage in the regulation or management of the emotions of the other party. Effective negotiators adjust their messages to adapt to what they perceive as the other party's emotional state. And this is also called emotional intelligence. So emotional intelligence, I've done videos on emotional intelligence, and it really is important to understand that emotional intelligence is one of the most powerful tools that we have as human beings, you know, understanding our emotions, being aware of other people's emotions, recognizing that we have the ability to control our own emotions and be able to affect the way other people can. And this, of course, can affect outcomes in negotiations. Well, that's about a 30-minute video, and uh, I hope that you've taken something valuable away that you can use uh, in this video in negotiations. And more than anything else, I hope that you have a great day because only you get to choose how you feel about it. I'm Dr. Paul Gerhardt.